Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me, Elena, and I am with, of course, the one, the only, the fabulous Chris. Chris, who have we got on today? Morning, mate. Uh, today we have got Marissa Haitsman, who is an anaesthetist, historian and writer, who has co-written the Ambrose Parry series of historical fiction books. And she's here today to talk to us about her newest book from the series, Voices of the Dead and the History of Anaesthetics. So hi, Marissa. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. Thank you very much. Quite interesting because we had one medical one a couple of weeks ago. So we're doing another one. It's quite interesting. We have very little medical history. So we're kind of excited to delve into something that we don't know much about today. Good. <laughs> Chris, I don't know. Why don't you start us off? I'm always starting us off with a question. I think Chris should go first today. Okay. I mean, we, we've done quite a few things with Richard Sugg, haven't we? We've done some really strange medical sort of things going on. And he, he sort of showed us that the 19th century is a bit mad with its medicine. So, Marissa, can you tell us the story of Charles Byrne and his, and his corpse? Sure. Charles Byrne was also known as the Irish Giant. Uh, I think there's um, some debate about how tall he actually was. Everyone recorded it slightly differently, but he was, I think he was about seven foot six. Um, and so uh, earned his money as a kind of sideshow specimen. Um, and because of his excess of height, the anatomists of the day, particularly John Hunter, was very keen to get his body after he died. And because he was suffering from a medical condition, which was obviously undiagnosed at that time, he was suffering from acromegaly. And without treatment, that's uh, quite life-limiting. So he died at the age of 22. And he had arranged with his friends that he would be buried at sea because he knew the anatomists were after him and he didn't want to be dissected. Unfortunately, the undertaker was bribed and his friends um, put his coffin into the sea that contained stones and not his body. And the anatomist John Hunter got the body, but because of the controversy around um, Charles Byrne, because he was quite a famous character in London at this time, um, Hunter kind of hid the fact he had the body. He didn't dissect him um, to learn anything from him. He boiled up his bones and articulated the skeleton and hung it in his own private collection. Um, so it's quite a tragic story. And the skeleton of Charles Byrne hung in the Royal College of Surgeons in London as an exhibit for more than 200 years. And there has been many uh, campaigns to have the man buried at sea, as was his explicit wishes. And as far as I understand it, the Royal College of Surgeons underwent a refurbishment over the last few years, and they have decided not to exhibit the skeleton anymore, but they are still keeping it in case they want to use it for research in the future. Uh, while you were talking about that, I decided to, to Google him and to have a look at what photographs exist, if any photographs do exist. And I'm looking now at his skeleton. And the first article that's come up is, he did not want this. One man's two-decade quest to let the Irish giant rest in peace. And that's all that's coming up is constantly that he just wants to rest at peace. So I think they should do that. Why exhibit his skeleton? We're not in the Victorian period anymore. We don't have mm. to stand there, point, and laugh at someone just because they're, I don't know, deformed or uh, uh, born, with, born with a defect or, or you know, normalise these things. Mm. I think... Um... I think most recently they extracted some DNA from one of the teeth in the skeleton and um, managed to ascertain what genetic defect um, had contributed to his condition and managed to trace some descendants to the north of Ireland somewhere. But I'm not sure that that really constitutes useful research. We know what causes acromegaly now. Um, if they've extracted his DNA, I'm not sure what use the skeleton's going to be. Um, and if you were really wanting, I was talking to an endocrinologist recently, actually, who uh, said that she couldn't 
see what else you could, what other information you could get from a skeleton. And if you wanted to display the skeleton, you could 3D print a version and actually, you know, put his bones to rest the way he wanted. So it's it's quite an it's it's an interesting ethical debate, I think. It's quite a creepy thing as well that the that the undertaker was bribed so that they could steal the skeleton. It's just, it just feels so un, underhand. Yeah, yeah. I don't think John Hunter, who is actually a, a very important figure in medical history, I don't think he comes out of the story very well. No. <laughs> well, we're here to talk about anaesthetic. Hmm. And probably the only thing I know about anaesthetic pre actual anaesthetic is chloroform especially used in modern day, you know, just to get someone to pass out, kidnap them and, you know, all of these stories that you read and, and whatnot. So my knowledge on that is very limited. So I'm really interested in knowing a little bit more. But what sort of anaesthetic existed pre-1850? Uh, well, the first anaesthetic agent was discovered in uh, October 1846. That was ether. And it was um, successfully demonstrated at Massachusetts General Hospital by a dentist called William Morton. Prior to that, though, there really wasn't anything terribly effective at all. I mean, I think we we have the, these notions of people getting blind drunk and biting on sticks and all this sort of stuff. But in fact, um, the attitude to pain at the time was that uh, you were supposed to endure it to improve your kind of moral health sort of thing. So people actually underwent uh, surgery, including things like amputation of limbs without anything at all they would be strapped down to a table and expected just to go on with it and the only thing that could be done to alleviate their suffering was for the surgeon to be really fast so uh, Robert Liston in uh, London was one of the fastest and he could amputate a leg through the thigh in 28 seconds <laughs> the guy that cut it was so quick that he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers as well. Yes, correct. Yes, <laughs> I love that story. Well, it's grim, but it's uh, <laughs> of that quick. They didn't even notice he went through his assistant's fingers. <laughs> yeah, that was the story whereby um, apparently he uh, cut his assistant's fingers because there was usually an audience for these things. I think he managed to cut through the clothing of a member of the audience. The member of the audience had a heart attack and died. The assistant, his his wounds were, became infected and he died and the mm. patient died. So it was an operation with a 300% mortality rate. Oh. My only question is, how could you hit someone in the audience? Was he just... <laughs> because they, they just stood around. It was, they, they, it was like early surgery was often a bit of a spectator sport. So... Um, not just medical people, but sometimes other people were invited to watch. <clears throat> right. Okay. Hold on. I'm trying to struggle <laughs> to get my question out here. D did people pay to see this spectacle? No, no. It was interested parties. So it was usually um, kind of upper middle class people who were quite interested in science and, and anatomy and so on. Often anatomy lectures at the time would be attended by artists who wanted to study the human body. To, to assist with their drawing and painting and so on. I know it's bizarre to think that, isn't it? But that's what happened. How, how would we just turn around one night and go, you know what, let's go watch someone get the leg amputated. No, I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> it was mainly medical people, to be fair, and medical students, other doctors, etc. But sometimes they were members of the public too. Well, moving on back to anaesthetic, because we're going on a wild ride here, something completely off topic. But uh, how did anaesthetic evolve through this period? Well, it was really interesting. There was lots of experiments trying to um, render people insensible to pain was what they were after. But what um, anaesthetics tend to do is they render you unconscious. But that, that was very scary for, for people back then because if someone became unconscious, it was usually a precursor to death. So they were very wary of, of these kind of strong chemicals. But they experimented with um, carbon dioxide, they experimented with um, they also they, they used all sorts of, of of different techniques. They tried nitrous oxide was discovered quite early in the 1800s, but it wasn't quite strong enough. Um, there was a suggestion it might be useful in surgical procedures, but they didn't really follow that up for some reason that's not quite clear. And then um, ether came along and 
there was a successful demonstration of ether um, in 1846. The patient was having a tumour removed from their neck. Um, they were rendered insensible, woke up afterwards, which was a really important thing. The concern was that they wouldn't wake up afterwards. He woke up afterwards and said he really didn't feel anything at all. And this was obviously what they had been looking for for a long time. And its impact was absolutely enormous. And the news of ether spread really fast uh, across the Atlantic, and it started to be used in the UK shortly after. Um, but it was quite tricky stuff to use, um, and some surgeons didn't like it and gave up on it quite quickly because patients um, sometimes became very restless and hard to handle and didn't actually go to sleep. So James Young Simpson, who was an obstetrician in Edinburgh, decided to search for something better. And he started experimenting on himself and his assistants by sitting around the dining room table of an evening and just sniffing various chemicals that they had found at the chemistry lab and so on, and often made themselves quite unwell in the process. But in November 1847, they sniffed something and all became unconscious very quickly, woke up under the dining room table and realised they discovered something better than ether, and that was chloroform. Uh, I think me and my friends had a similar experience when we discovered cider. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, we're laughing at how funny it is, or let's say I'm laughing at how funny it is, but in reality, it's quite interesting, and the best way to do these things in, in that period, obviously not now, you know, having your friends down, let's, let's sniff some chemicals, see what happens, but in those days, they were interested in, in testing the boundaries and things like that. So mm. you can't really look at them from a modern perspective and go, well, I really wouldn't have done that. It's kind of weird and creepy. But I think it's really amazing how they just all bust out by sniffing chloroform. And, and that's really what we're going to be kind of talking about next, really. Mm -hmm. Chloroform, um, which mm. is Queen Victoria, really. Did she actually use chloroform during childbirth? What happened? She well, she did. And the interesting thing was um, chloroform was obviously taken up very enthusiastically by surgeons, but there was a lot of controversy about its use in childbirth. Um, there was a lot of debate about whether it was appropriate to alleviate the pain of childbirth at all, because uh, some people considered it was um, a divine ordinance for women to suffer in childbirth. It was written down in Genesis, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. So there was a lot of people who felt it was inappropriate to take away that pain. Um, usually men, I have to add. Um, and so this was, so all through 1848, 1849, Simpson was having to push quite strongly um, for women to receive pain relief in labor and prove that it was safe and effective. And it, took and there was a lot of resistance especially from the the kind of very eminent obstetricians in London against its use um, and then in 1853 Queen Victoria had chloroform for the birth of her eighth child um, and it was a completely normal delivery it wasn't complicated but she she had chloroform for the pain relief and um they tried to keep it quiet for a while. They didn't want everyone to know because they thought then all women would start demanding it. But it got out and all resist the kind of the residual resistance to using it in childbirth kind of faded away after that. Of course, all the uh, leading obstetricians who were against it are all men as well. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, of course they they were, and some of their objections, some of their objections were quite reasonable. You know, they th they thought it might interfere with the progress of labour, it might slow things down, it might be dangerous for the woman or the unborn child. These were all quite reasonable. But the other things they started talking about were. Things like um, it would be bad for the moral well-being of the woman, that it would it's much better for her to suffer, it would help her moral fibre. They wor worried about women becoming slightly disinhibited when they, they were breathing ether and chloroform. Some of them became quite flirty and amorous with their assistants. Some of them uh, used bad language. And this was deemed completely unacceptable. And one obstetrician suggested that um, the, the women of England would rather suffer any amount of pain and perhaps even death itself, rather than behave in such an embarrassing fashion. I think we should just uh, kick the I, doctors in the balls, really, and see how they take it and see if they want a bit of chloroform or ether. 
<laughs> yeah, the, one of the endearing thing, enduring things from uh, watching my children being born is that no one gets in the way when the drugs come out. <laughs> bring, bring in the pain relief. <laughs> mm. I, it really annoys me, this whole kind of ideology that women have to be hardcore and pain and I have to kind of go, th- do you know what, when men let me say this differently so recently this whole thing's come up on on platforms like tiktok and whatnot where men are being given simulations of period cramps for example Mm. and some women have it extremely difficult and they're actually shown what it's like at like number 10 and they're writhing on the floor dying and crying going oh my god i can't function this is the end of the world well Mm. no Yes, you know. absolutely. This is, this is why I don't, James Simpson is quite a, a hero of mine because um, his position that uh, labour was just as painful as most sur- surgical operations um, and so women deserved pain relief j- just for normal labour, not for difficult labours, not for instrumental deliveries, but for any labour. Um, and I think he was a bit of a head of his time. And um, for that reason, I think he... Um, He's a bit of a medical hero of mine. So well, there was also a doctor who was testing the chloroform on his, on his dinner guest, wasn't there, at one point? Yeah, that was Simpson. He, <laughs> they had this rather unusual attitude to it in that whenever he had a dinner party, not always, but often when he had a dinner party, he would get the ether or the chloroform out after dinner for a bit of recreational use. Um, that was actually pretty common. They used to be, they used to do it with nitrous oxide ether they called it ether frolics where people would inhale a little bit and get a bit merry but um, Hans Christian Andersen was at one of Simpson's dinner parties when he got the ether out and um, there were some lady authors who were sniffing the ether and getting very giddy and Hans Christian Andersen was very disapproving he wrote a letter to a friend afterwards saying that he thought it was disgraceful (laughs) he was very um, unhappy about it all and I'm not sure if it was because it was ladies misbehaving. Um, I think he felt that it was a great discru- discovery and a great boon to medicine and it shouldn't be messed about with. But Simpson frequently, he had mad dinner parties. <laughs> I would love to have attended one. I think it would have been very interesting. What's the difference from a mad dinner party nowadays to a mad dinner party then? It's just the different type of drug, really, at the end of the day. I think so. I think, I think, however, um, overdoing the chloroform was potentially quite risky. I think, it, and it's also quite toxic stuff. We don't use it anymore because it's it's really quite toxic. So, um, I certainly wouldn't recommend. It. <laughs> well, we also get a rise in mesmerism, which I still have no idea what it is. So, I'm hopefully you're going to tell me what that is. It's an it's an alternative. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, there was before mesmerism was one of the the things that they were interested in before anesthesia came along. Um, it was the precursor to medical hypnosis, <clears throat> but it had a very checkered history. Um, in that people could be induced into a trance-like state, and um, it was demonstrated that they often withstood various painful stimuli. So, if if you could. Um, stick pins in people when they were in a mesmeric trance and they wouldn't really respond. So there was some interest in it as a form of um, pain relief, but it didn't really get very far because they kept um, doing kind of strange things with it and it kept falling into disrepute. For example, um, its originator was a man called Anton Mesmer, um, who held... um, magnetic seances in Paris he was convinced that there was a magnetic fluid in all living things and it could be manipulated to the benefit of your health and well-being but he used to um there's descriptions of him holding these seances in his Paris apartment and it would usually be wealthy women that participated and they would sit around a kind of metal tub that had glass bottles filled with water and iron filings to kind of enhance the magnetic effect. They would sit round in a kind of circle and they would all be induced into a kind of weird trance state and often ended up with kind of feeling quite euphoric and perhaps having seizures. Uh, But that might have had something to do with the fact that there were very attractive male assistants who stood behind them and massaged their legs and their breasts. And you're like, 
what? what? <laughs> this is crazy stuff. So that you can't really, I don't know that the effects they were achieving were attributable to some magnetic fluid. It, all, it was all bonkers. Anyway, it fell into disrepute for a while and then came back in the 1830s when there was a man called Elliotson who started experimenting at University College Hospital. And again, it started off with two young girls who suffered from seizures. They underwent mesmeric therapy and got a bit better. But he started experimenting with them and kept them in hospital for months while he was doing his experiments and kept putting them into trances every day and had eminent people come round to watch the things that they they could um that they would do while under trances and it started getting a bit daft again the young girls quite liked the attention so they started speaking in tongues they started um pretending that they could read minds predict the future um so again it all got a bit crazy and it was discredited again and one of the problems was that uh, all these very eminent medical men did not think two young working class girls could pull the wool over their eyes. So they believed everything that was happening. Um, and then in the 1850s, it came back again. Um, and there was a man called Braid in Manchester who uh, had a very sober approach to the whole thing. And he coined the term hypnosis. And if you read his work, it's very much like hypnosis today without all the kind of daft stuff that other people got a bit fascinated with. It was very sober and measured. And I think that was really um, where hypnosis came from. So it was interesting. There was definitely a genuine phenomenon there, but it kept getting lost in amongst all the kind of crazy stuff. So it took a really long time for it to become established as a useful medical um, practice. And talking of crazy stuff, though, along with mesmerism, you get a rise in spiritualism as well, don't you? Mm, yeah, yeah. I think, I think there was, given the the kind of medical advances in the mid nineteenth century, I think everyone was quite credulous of new and marvelous things. So when um, spiritualism came along, and there was a suggestion that you could contact the dead and have um, some kind of uh, conversations with them. Uh, people wanted to believe that was true um, and the again it was interesting spiritualism really came from um, some sisters called the Fox sisters who again were teenage girls who apparently could communicate with the dead and the spirit that they were in contact with was called Mr Splitfoot um, which is interesting because I think they were being quite mischievous and basically trying to tell everyone what they were up to in a kind of subtle way, because they were making rapping sounds. Um, and it's it was, they used to say to the spirit, knock once for yes, twice for no. And there would be these rapping sounds on the table. But what they were actually doing was, was using the bones in their foot to wrap the floorboards. It was a kind of weird double jointed thing, I think. Um, but everyone believed that they were talking to the spirits and, um, and you can understand that belief, people, if you've got the chance to speak to your loved ones, again, you'd probably want to take that up. And so spiritualism kind of rose out of that. And they made huge amounts of money doing tours in the US and the UK. And um, eventually, years later, one of them faced up. One of them said, actually, what we were doing was, you know, knocking the floorboards with the bones of our feet. And no one believed them. <laughs> it had become too big. Uh, and so that's where spiritualism came from. Um, and one of the big, I think one of the big things is just that willingness to believe or that desire, that need to believe in something that kind of makes these things hang around. I mean, I mean the, the thing that gets me is a lot of this stuff that you read about, you think, oh, that's a bit mad, that's bonkers, we wouldn't believe that sort of stuff now. And of course we do, we're all still prone to believing stuff that we want to believe, even when the evidence is not, well, it's quite strongly against it. Like the man who uh, led a demonstration saying that birds aren't real as a joke. And then there's a cult of people in America now who believe that birds aren't real. And there's all the government, they're all government drones. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think a lot of this is, is down to the fact that people don't like, don't like not knowing or the fact that, you know, 
even very eminent people will sometimes say, we don't know why that happens. And people don't like that lack of certainty. They would rather, they would rather be certain there's some grand government conspiracy than accepting the fact that sometimes you don't know. You just don't know. Spiritualism for me is a bit of a, well, bit of a, it's a massive gray area. It's something of the unknown. So for example, like ghosts and poltergeists and evil spirits, it's something I don't want to believe in. Mm. But there's always that slight possibility that it's true. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the unknown and it's the unknown. So I kind of, when it comes down to the subject, I feel a little bit like I'm in the Victorian period mm -hmm. of the great unknown. And it's terrible. That is why I will not watch poltergeist films because there's a possibility it could just be true. Slasher films, not a problem. But poltergeist, ju just because there is a chance, it could be true. Mm. Yeah, I think. I think that, that that whole sense of we just don't know is really uncomfortable for people. And I, I do think, I mean, I don't really believe in ghosts myself, but I do believe that people see things and experience things that they can't quite explain. And I think the human brain is a really strange and complex thing that we don't still fully understand. But I am sure in the future, neuroscience will explain a lot of the things that we have questions about just now. But when it, you know when people see ghosts or hear noises and have experiences, I'm sure they are having these experiences. I don't think they're lying, but I think the explanation will come. That's what I think. All I'm going to say is, is, when I walked down that corridor, there was someone stood by that back door. Honestly, I was like, there was someone stood there within the one the one I saw. There was mm. definitely someone stood there. Um, it was really creepy. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not denying people have these experiences and I can't explain them, but I think they'll be explained in the future. Yeah, I can't explain one experience. Well, actually, it's been multiple experiences while I've done it and I don't want to do it again. Well, I probably will have to at some stage is walk through Auschwitz in the dark. Oh, and goodness. It's so horrific, the experience and the feelings. I know a lot of my friends work and especially in the wintertime, it gets dark at like four or five o'clock in the mm, evening. Mm. And some people have worked till six, maybe seven, eight o'clock, and they have to walk through. Oh my God, it was horrific. And my, the hairs stood up on the end of my arms. I felt people were watching me. And there's weird experiences coming from places like that. But that's a whole different other kettle of fish. Mm. But just needed to throw that one in there. Mm, absolutely. Anyway, we're going on another tangent. Mm hmm which is fun because Chris and I love going on a good tangent, but mm -hmm. let's stick with spiritualism anyway. And you, we've got another name in this mix and that's, that's De Simpson. Tell us a little about him and what he did about spiritualism. Well, it was the, it's the same James Simpson who discovered chloroform. It's one of the reasons that I'm um, slightly obsessed with the man. Um, there are about five different biographies written about him. And in one of them, there was this description of how he disrupted a psychic reading at a big theatre in Edinburgh. Um, there was a man, um, the, the man on the stage and his daughter who had special powers and was a medium and a psychic and could um, read the future and all sorts of things. And Simpson went along to cause some mischief because that's what he was like. And he, um, the medium asked if people could write something on a bit of paper and put it in a sealed box and she would divine what had been written so simpson wrote something and put it in a box and um she 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 said just you know it's, it's a, uh, the common thing that people would put in the box and she said that he had put the box she he had put some money in the box and simpson didn't go along with it he strode up to the the stage insisted they open the box and show everyone what was in it. And he had put in some millet seed and had written on a piece of paper, humbug. <laughs> and the audience left at that point. He disrupted the whole thing. So in the, in the book we've written, we um, have him disrupt a spiritualist evening and the person who suffered, we've created a kind of fictional medium who suffered as a result of this, gets his revenge on Simpson by holding a seance at his house and creeping everyone out. 
that's clever i like that being able to take a, an actual story and kind of yeah i like that that's interesting sorry i haven't to think there twice <laughs> chris i've done all the talking you do some talking okay and my brain just stopped just like that <laughs> <laughs> so is, this is one of the many instances of science sort of disproving the pseudoscience uh, how does science ultimately win out over sort of uh, spiritualism well i think what's interesting about the 19th century is conventional medicine was trying very hard to get onto scientific footing um and still wasn't very scientific uh, they had discovered anesthesia which was huge obviously they still didn't understand germ theory they didn't really understand where infection came from they um thought that pussy wounds was a good thing they they called it the laudable pus so when something got pussy they thought that was tissue healing um they were starting to isolate drugs such as morphine quinine iodine so the chemistry was improving and they were getting far more um specific with the drugs that they were using but they were still stuck in the past in that they still um, used bleeding as a treatment so they would extract a whole lot of blood from you sometimes till you fainted and they thought that was a good thing and um, they used leeches purging it was it was very still not very scientific so in some ways it's interesting that they were pontificating about pseudoscience when they weren't particularly scientific themselves but through the 19th century things did become far more scientific there were advances in understanding of disease pathology chemistry physiology and by the end of the 19th century I think they really were on a far firmer footing so I think science um, won out in the end over things like spiritualism but all these pseudosciences are still there I think Conventional medicine is doing battle with this stuff all the time. Um, and I think part of the problem now is that modern medicine is intensely complicated. Um, it's so complicated that I think a lay person really struggles to kind of understand everything. You know, everyone Googles stuff, you know, when they have symptoms of anything, they Google it. And I tell you, no matter what your symptom is, an itchy eyelid or a small spot, you're on Google, you're two steps away from cancer, no matter what it is you're looking at. And so I don't think that's particularly helpful. I think modern medicine is so complicated, you really need someone qualified to help you navigate it a little bit. Um, but there's also a kind of distrust of experts sometimes, and people feel, because there's so much information readily available that it's their responsibility to kind of understand it all themselves. And I'm not sure it's really possible. So um, in the, when it's hard to understand something yourself, if someone is giving you an easy explanation, something that's easy to understand, I can understand, it's very attractive to kind of go there. You know, if someone's saying, I have this oil or, natural extract that's going to solve all your problems that's attractive to people isn't it I understand that so recently I was suffering certain ailments and I went on to google and I convinced myself I was diabetic mm -hmm. I then went to the doctor had blood tests fasting every single test that could prove I'm a diabetic and all negative mm -hmm. so <laughs> the crazy part of me was like, oh my god I'm going to it's because I've got other issues I was like oh for god's sakes there's another one that's it. it's the end of the world google, mm. google worst thing worst thing in the world I'm surprised I didn't reach that I have some sort of not that there is a diabetic cancer but <laughs> you know that I have diabetic cancer or something it's that's absolutely ridiculous it's evil don't google mm. things no don't google medical things no chris have you googled any medical things mm, um yeah all the time but i usually <laughs> I, I, I self medicate for everything so it's like yeah i'll be fine but i did hear a story helen baxendale the actress years back in the 90s she would play the doctor in a medical program and they used to for authenticity they used to carry around a little doctor's handbook with them and she said that regularly if she was feeling dodgy, she'd flick through the handbook to try and figure out what she had. And she'd like diagnosed herself with cholera and dengue fever and all kinds of horrific illnesses and convinced herself that she was dying just from reading the medical handbooks. So even pre-Google, it was a problem. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm sorry, I'm sitting here on mute and laughing hysterically at the microphone and nobody can hear me. Anyway, we've got one more question, which is mm-hmm. at the Adelphi Theatre. Tell us a little bit about that. that. That was quite an interesting thing. When we were working on the book, um, Voices of the Dead, there's a story. Um, for the purposes of the story, we needed a theatre to go on fire. And we were <clears throat> researching the theatres in Edinburgh in 1853, um, there was the Theatre Royal that was um, doing quite well for itself and the Adelphi that was struggling a little bit. And we noticed that coincidentally in 1853, there was a fire and the Adelphi Theatre burned down and we thought that's a bit of a spooky coincidence. And then we read a little bit more about it and um, it was rebuilt after that fire and then a few years later burned down again. And a few years after that, rebuilt, burned down again. Happened about four or five times. There's no kind of good explanation for why it was so flammable. (laughs) Um, And it's just one of those quirky things that you come across that um, we initially we thought how convenient that it burned down in 1853, but in fact it just burned down every couple of years. And there is no theatre on the site now. (laughs) I don't know if that's anything to do with it. (laughs) It's a shopping centre now. Has the shopping centre burnt down at all? No, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Oh wow! Maybe maybe uh, it was cursed. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Maybe too many spirit, spiritualist uh, mediums yeah. have been in there. And <laughs> <laughs> oh no! But um, yeah, Marissa, this would be really, really interesting. Um, do you want to tell us about your book uh, about um, the setting of the book and the series? Yes. Yeah. We. I write with my husband, uh, Chris Brickmeyer, who's been a crime writer for about 25 years, and we have started uh, writing a historical crime series based in Edinburgh in the late 1840s and early 1850s, kind of centred around the house of James Young Simpson at 52 Queen Street, and his uh, apprentice, a young doctor called Will Raven, and his housemaid, a woman called Sarah Fisher, um, get embroiled in all sorts of... uh, underhand business in Edinburgh, various crimes they get involved with. Um, Often there's a medical slant to it because my interest is history of medicine. And in the current book, Voices of the Dead, uh, body parts have been found in Surgeon's Hall and they're not anatomy specimens. So Raven and Fisher get um, asked to make some discreet inquiries and work out who's been killed and why. So uh, when's the book out? Uh, It was... This is the fourth novel in the series, Voices of the Dead, and it was published last week. Ah, excellent. So uh, what, what we'll try and do is we'll try and get it into the History Hack uh, bookshop, which means that we get a tiny slice of every sale. You get a larger slice and, lift, and a larger slice of money than you would if it went through a popularly ne- um, mm-hmm. forestry named website, which I'm not allowed to mention because if I do, the owner will sue me for the few pennies I have left. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on and talking to us. No, i delighted. Thanks very much. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.